Welcome to another interesting episode of Open Book On Location. I'm Katie Poole, the board chair of the Literary Alliance and a passionate reader like you. Now in our 12th year, our all-volunteer nonprofit provides these fabulous conversations with your favorite authors. At our website, PasadenaLiteraryAlliance.org, you can find more author interviews, make donations to the Alliance to allow us to provide grants for literary initiatives, and participate, send questions for the authors, or contribute author suggestions at the Contact Us tab. See you soon at Open Book On Location. Sewell Chan. I'm the opinion page editor at the Los Angeles Times, and I am really thrilled to be taking part in this conversation with two of my favorite authors and thinkers, Suzanne Nossel, author of Dare to Speak, and Andrew Morantz, author of Antisocial. Um, I've actually known both Suzanne and Andrew for a number of years. Uh, I am proud to be a member of PEN America, the organization that Suzanne leads that defends free expression at a time when that defense cannot be taken for granted and really is more important than ever. Um, Suzanne, uh, I met in New York a number of years ago. I've gotten to become friends with she, her and her husband, David, uh, and their family. And it's really, really wonderful to be here today, Suzanne, with, uh, with you to talk about the important ideas in your book. Uh, I met Andrew Morantz maybe a decade ago when he was a young journalist at the New Yorker magazine and I was working at the New York Times. And I've just been so, um, uh, blown away by the quality of his reporting uh, over the years. His book, Antisocial, is uh, uh, truly both gripping uh, and disturbing and also, of course, really, really essential. And I'm really, really glad to be here with Andrew today. Free speech, of course, is one of the central issues of our time, and it feels under threat from so many directions. Um, I'll just enumerate at least three. Um, around the world, there, as authoritarianism is rising, there are increasingly uh, you know, hard forms of censorship, crackdowns on exchange of ideas, and really threats to the free exchange of information, including threats against journalists who've been harmed or even killed in the course of doing their work. A second set of threats, I think, emerge from the uh, largely unregulated technologies that have really transformed our lives and how we communicate. The proliferation of misinformation, hate speech, extreme ideologies, using social media and using other uh, platforms in the dark web, which Andrew has really studied extensively, are really, really disturbing because they raise profound questions about how it's possible to have civil discourse at a time when there's so many lies being spread. And then finally, um, I would point to a set of concerns that Suzanne really takes up in her book, which are, which are really debates about, that, especially prominent on college campuses and in the media about you know, who gets to have a voice and whether you know, certain kinds of speech are kind of too offensive to be to be tolerated or accepted in open society. And it gets into really um, politically fraught questions about whether some speech is um, either so dangerous or so harmful that it should never be uttered because it causes even physical harm. And those many of those debates are actually occurring within um, kind of liberal America, within people who love the world of books and ideas, but are trying to really understand, um, you know, what a what are the boundaries, if any, of appropriate free speech? Many, and, and this conflict has many generational dimensions. A lot of younger people are saying um, that you know speech can cause real harm um, in terms of physical violence, in, current, in terms of mental trauma, and um, are, are there instances in which it just you know should it should it should be canceled? And I think that's a very very lively debate right now. You know, I'm not sure it's as mainstream um, as the other two, but it's actually an extremely important debate, especially among people who really pay attention to books and journalism. So with that introduction, I'd like to start a little bit with Suzanne, if that's all right. Sure. All right, Suzanne, thank you so much. Great to see you again. Likewise, great to see you. Tell me a little bit about what prompted the writing of your book. Yeah, look, I, I would say I sort of trace it back kind of approximately to 
A moment a few years ago when I was at a conference of free speech experts, actually at Wellesley College, and it was just as the protests at Yale and the University of Missouri were really bubbling up at Yale. It was over a over Halloween costumes and a memo that had been sent out by a kind of dean of a residential college. Uh, she was rebutting a university-wide sort of semi-directive saying, you've got to be very careful with your Halloween costumes. They could offend people. You know, please consider, think twice before you uh, don costumes that might invoke stereotypes or otherwise put people off. And she forcefully rebutted that, saying that college students needed more agency, that the university shouldn't be coming in and policing this. And it just triggered an absolute firestorm. At the University of Missouri, uh, it was a different set of issues, a feeling that the patterns of racism and uh, racial incidents on campus had, been, had grown out of control and the students were in uproar, protesting, demonstrating there was a hunger strike. And so we were here meeting as a group of free speech experts amidst all this. And there was a lot of consternation, people sort of you know, saying how awful it was that uh, you know, speech was being punished and this rising generation was, uh, seemed opposed to the principle of free speech. And in the midst of all this, it was, the event was mostly these experts, but it was open to students. And a student who happened to be the president of the student body there kind of piped up and she said, you know, what, what's really being asked for here is a different level of conscientiousness when it comes to speech. And, and, and you know, why is that so wrong? What's so wrong with that? And there was something about kind of that moment, listening to this like very reasonable young woman uh, and seeing how she saw it and, and this, you know, quite logical, legitimate plea that she was making that, you know, amidst all of this, we also need to think about how we're using speech and that in a, in a more diverse, equal, inclusive, and equitable society that there, there are certain requirements that kind of redound to us as speakers. And, you know, what I concluded was that the defense of free speech, which I'm very passionate about, would be strengthened if we could uh, you know, both explain to the, to those who want to uh, utilize their speech, free speech, you know, what that entails, how to do it responsibly, you know, in an evolving society, you know, how to be more conscientious, how to take care when you speak, how to stand up for those whose voices are excluded, uh, you know, at this, and at the same time, you know, how, how to avoid being censorious, how to, uh, you know, avoid punishments or even asking for punishments directed at speech. And so the book really is centered around 20 principles that I think kind of go together and are interlocking and, you know, I hope offer a kind of enlightened perspective and version, vision for free speech that can address some of the concerns that are being raised by a rising generation. Suzanne, your book is not only kind of an essential primer and one that I think is really necessary at the moment, but it's really a book that I think if, if leaders read in particular, uh, and I'm not just talking about the elected ones, um, you know, it would really improve the quality of our discourse as a society. I wanted to ask you about some of the thorny issues, you know, raised in the current debates. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the letter that was circulated in Harper's Magazine recently by a number of very prominent intellectuals and writers and scholars you know, making an argument that, in my view, you know, is, is kind of, you know, not easily contested, which is that, you know, there is a, that, that, that free speech is really, really important, that we have to make space for difficult ideas. And kind of arguing in particular, though, and I think this is the most controversial part of the argument, was the argument that, um, you know, some places um, within the left or w within liberal America are, are actually become quite intolerant of unpopular ideas, in particular universities. Um, and and uh, the Harper's article itself received a lot of attention, including negative attention online and on Twitter, causing some to talk about a so-called cancel culture in which people who express politically unorthodox or um, you know less than doctrinaire ideas get kind of shouted out or shut down. Could you speak to this controversy? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I think it does illustrate a lot of what I talk about in the book. And, you know, one of my reactions to it was sort of, this is why I needed 
20 principles, because it's as if when you're talking about these issues, there's a lot you have to say. You can defend free speech. You can talk about how problematic it is when people uh, are punished, uh, even just informally, by uh, internet mobs that come after them for you know, what could be a mistaken, you know, misstated, perhaps clumsy, awkward, cringeworthy, you know, but not willfully bigoted, you know, or otherwise, uh, you know, deliberately nefarious speech. And, 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 you know, the kind of avalanche of opprobrium that that can attract, you know, I believe is chilling. But I think, you know, when you talk about that problem, I do think you also have to talk about sort of these other elements of the picture, the voices that get silenced routinely, you know, the, the obligations. I have a whole chapter in the book about sort of the duty of care that attaches, and particularly when you have a platform. And so, you know, I think one of the criticisms is a lot of these people sort of have platforms. Some of them, you know, have used them uh, in, in ways that might be debatable. But I think one of the, I, you know, to me what it illustrated was sort of the difficulty of talking about part of this argument without uh, underscoring all of the rest of it. So it's sort of, I, I, you know, I was lucky enough to have the entire space of a book. You know, these people were trying to put together a few paragraphs. And so they did talk about justice and the importance of the protest movements. But I think that part of the message sort of got drowned out. And there was a feeling that this was, you know, self-serving and not acknowledging you know, all of what it will take to realize free speech in this country, you know, which involves, to my mind, you know, what's addressed in the letter, as well as, you know, a whole series of other elements that were kind of beyond the scope of it, but that are, you know, no less important in, in some instances, you know, much more important and timely and urgent. And I said, so I think that was part of it. You know, an interesting subplot, of course, was that people got criticized for the company that they, kept uh, as signatories of the letter. And it was sort of as if people were saying, you know, so-and-so was canceled and by being on a letter with them, you know, you, you're cancel worthy too. And I think that's very problematic. I think, you know, here with this letter, you had people from different places in the ideological spectrum, from different professions. You know, people might disagree on almost everything, but they kind of came together around this one set of ideas and words. And I, I you know, I think that's, more good than bad. I think we need to find little islands of common ground wherever we can and encourage people to uh, come on to them and see where that conversation may go rather than trying to build walls and say, you know, you, even if, if the principles are right or the message is right, the very fact that so-and-so has subscribed to it, you know, makes it out of bounds. Suzanne, one of the great powers of your book is that you really come to this from, with a real international perspective. Uh, you were a diplomat at the State Department, and the organization you run now defends writers and creators and thinkers who are, in some cases, imp have been imprisoned, um, tortured, or even lost their lives um, because of um, because authoritarian governments have have you know believed their ideas to be dangerous. You also were working, um, as I understand it, um, uh, on the U.S. response to a controversy that occurred about more than a decade ago, uh, involving a Danish newspaper that published a cartoon depicting the Prophet Muhammad, um, something that many Muslims in Europe uh, became very, very offended about, and it caused some, uh, some disturbances even. Could you tell us a little bit about what happened in that controversy, your role in trying to address it, and how that applies to some of the debates, uh, speech debates going on in America right now? Yeah, sure. So just in brief, so you know, this Dan these Danish cartoons were depictions of the Muslim prophet Muhammad in kind of compromising poses. They were, um, you know, send ups, um, satirical, uh, you know, in some cases, there's a, a bomb coming out of his turban. And they were published and nothing happened. And then a few months later, uh, uh, you know, certain clerics kind of got wind of them or focused on them and uh, an outrage was mobilized and there were protests outside Danish embassy installations around the world. And, uh, you know, I think more than a dozen people killed in Afghanistan uh, at a demonstration in opposition to the cartoons. And the Danes were sort of horrified thinking of themselves as great standard bearers for human rights. And, you know, it was sort of a, you know, this idea that speech could trigger such uproar was jarring, I think, to a lot of people, you know, not least the Danish publisher, uh, Jyllands Posten, that uh, 
agreed to, to print the cartoons. And in the wake of that, the organization of the Islamic Conference, as it was then uh, called, uh, a group of delegations of the United Nations decided to sort of press forward with resolutions and an attempt at an international treaty that would ban the defamation of, res of religion. Uh, you know, that things like the Danish cartoons essentially would be banned under international human rights law. And the U.S. was strongly opposed to that on the basis that it was a violation of free speech. And so we were going to U.N. meetings in New York and Geneva twice a year fighting against this defamation of religion resolution. And we were rallying votes and doing uh, big campaign operations uh, around the world and on the streets of New York, trying to defeat this resolution and doing it kind of twice a year, like clockwork. And you know, I kind of got to my post at the State Department and, you know, all this was explained to me and, you know, it seemed kind of nuts. It seemed like the Islamic delegations were concerned about what they felt was insulting and undermining to their religious identity and certain treasured values. And, you know, the, the Western delegations, the U.S. and its allies in Europe and elsewhere, you know, were trying to uphold the principle of free speech, but that this, you know, sh kind of shouting match at the U.N. was doing nobody any favors. And so what we decided to put forward was an effort to see whether we could propose an alternative resolution that would get at the underlying concerns of religious intolerance and bigotry, but without banning speech. And it was sort of like, if you could say enough and do enough to address the problem of somebody feeling targeted, demeaned, uh, insecure by virtue of their identity, could you then tamp down their demand for curbs on speech? And, you know, it was, it was a complex process involved a, a trip to Islamabad and uh, to many other capitals around the world to forge a consensus on this, but ultimately we did. And they pulled the idea of defamation of religion and it has not come back. And there's an alternative resolution that focuses on positive measures to foster religious tolerance. And to me, it, you know, it is a bit of a model for what we're dealing with here, that you have to, you know, really step forward and come through in terms of addressing whether it's religious intolerance or racism or gender discrimination or homophobia, transphobia. And, you know, if, if you, if people are convinced that their concerns are being taken on board and addressed, their impulse to demand curbs on noxious speech, you know, directed at that, those groups, uh, you know, can, uh, can, can be curbed. Because, you know, my, my, my view is ultimately, you know, these are very serious societal scourges, but the answer to them does not lie in government prohibitions against speech. And, you know, you touched on my international work and, you know, a lot of that is informed by just seeing where these government prohibitions go when yep. you uh, allow an authority to clamp down on speech, you know, they do it in very self-serving ways that don't end up benefiting democracy, individual rights, you know, the status of minorities or any of the other goals that we're concerned with. But, you know, a lot of Americans might ask though, but what about, you know, what about hate, hate speech uh, laws or prohibitions in a country like Germany uh, or in other European countries where because of a legacy of uh, past history with fascism and totalitarianism, there really is, you know, a desire to kind of protect um, vulnerable minorities against hateful speech. What do you make of that notion? Should we have such curbs in the U.S. where sometimes, you know, we're seen as a little bit as Americans as First Amendment absolutists? Is that is that absolutism too far? Yeah, look, you know, you can understand why Germany has adopted laws, for example, banning Holocaust denial, but they end up being very problematic. And actually, it would come up a lot in the course of the debate over the defamation of religion. You know, we would say, you know, free speech doesn't permit, you know, uh, banning, you know, this specific kind of viewpoint. And they would say, well, but, you know, in, in, in much of Europe, Holocaust denial is banned. So you're protecting another group. You're protecting Jews from, you know, anti-Semitic speech. And, and you need to protect us. And I think that's a really good illustration of the problem, which is, you know, where do you draw the lines? Who decides what is hateful speech? You know, uh, you know, what if it's satirical? What if it's, um, you know, Palestinian rights advocacy that some Jews and Zionists, you know, believe is anti-Semitic? Like those are difficult line drawing questions. And I think the problem is entrusting them to government, which will make decisions in ways that, you know, serve them politically. And so, you know, I understand why Germany has the rules it has. It hasn't eradicated, uh, 
you know, anti-Semitism or hateful attitudes in that country. You know, there's just a big story this week about how kind of neo-Nazism is boiling up again. And, you know, we see similar rates. Like I, I actually was just looking at the numbers in terms of uh, increases in anti-Semitic incidents in the U.S. and Germany over the last year. And the increase is like almost identical. It's like 12% in both countries, a 12% jump year over year. So, you know, their hate speech laws aren't tamping that down. So I don't think they work. I think they can be misused. There are other, also instances, you know, where they're used against the sort of minorities and dissidents who in some cases are, you know, arguing for them maybe in the U.S. context, but counter, their counterparts in Europe end up being targeted by these very same laws. So uh, I just don't think it's the best solution. And I think there are a, a lot of unintended side effects. Uh, and, you know, and then our approach, ultimately, we should stick with it and just try to make it work better. I think the, the First Amendment, you know, and the current interpretation has sort of stood the test of time. At we, we need to do a whole series of things to make our discourse more functional and constructive, uh, you know, but one of them isn't expanding government's power to suppress speech given us a lot to think about. I mean, as an editor, and I'm proud that the Los Angeles Times recently published an op-ed of yours uh, derived from your book, you know, I'm really mindful every day of our responsibilities as a platform and to, you know, try to elevate and amplify voices that need to be encouraged, um, but also to, you know, try to push for as wide a possible spectrum of debate. So what you're saying resonates with me. I do want to ask you about one more case study that, uh, that comes out in your book. Um, several years ago, the uh, writer and historian Ian Baruma, who's a very uh, distinguished uh, uh, scholar of uh, Dutch origin who lives in the United States, uh, he was the editor of the New York Review of Books, a very esteemed literary journal, of course, at a time when it published an essay, if I'm getting my facts right, the essay cast some doubt about one of the Me Too cases, if I'm getting this right and uh, raised some questions about whether or not the case had been, had been, uh, had been handled uh, uh, appropriately. And uh, it, this caused a whole firestorm that ultimately resulted in uh, Mr. Baruma losing his, uh, his position as editor. What did you make of that episode? Yeah, I mean, it was, he published a very controversial article that was essentially a defense by someone who was a subject of multiple allegations of sexual harassment and impropriety, you know, was never found guilty, but had signed something in Canada called Peace Bond, which is, you know, somewhat of an acknowledgement of guilt, and gave, you know, wrote this kind of very long and florid uh, apologia that it felt as if the review was kind of publishing almost unedited, and there had been there are some signs that Baruma had gone forward with this piece, you know, a little bit outside the normal processes in terms of the involvement of other editorial staff. And it was published. There was a huge firestorm. Baruma gave an interview where he sort of indicated that he didn't think uh, Gomeshi's guilt or innocence was really at issue here and that this was just an important perspective, you know, from an accused in the Me Too movement. And, you know, Baruma was out of a job within, you know, I'd say about 42 or 78, 48 or 40, 72 hours. And I thought it was unfortunate. You know, I, I think in that instance, look, I, I don't know that publishing this piece uh, was a, a, a good idea. It, it seemed, it did seem problematic because uh, I don't think it was fact checked. I think there were certain assertions that really were contested after the fact. You know, it was a bad mistake, uh, but to punish someone summarily in the wake of a mistake like that, I think does strike a certain fear in the hearts of you know, their successors and editors everywhere that you know, if you take a risk, if you go out on a limb, you, know, you, you may be out yourself. And you know, that's what worries me about this is that people become overly cautious. And, and you know, ultimately, I think social change requires a kind of openness to new perspectives, a willingness to go out on a limb, to be edgy, to put someone in print who you might not think, you know, not everybody's going to agree deserves a platform. And, you know, that there needs to be some room for error. And it just felt in this case, you know, they might have done uh, a probe into, you know, how this happened, taken some steps to ensure that the editorial process involved more people, and you know, put in place safeguards uh, against the publication of something that probably did not belong in print in exactly the form it took. But to kind of summarily oust the editor, you know, to me was uh, too quick and too draconian a response. 
you know, Suzanne, if you don't mind my, my sharing my own perspective recently with an op-ed, I, I used to be the deputy of the op-ed page at the New York Times. And um, the op-ed, that page recently published uh, an um, op-ed by Senator Tom Cotton uh, calling for uh, the use of um, active duty military to uh, quell some of the unrest and disturbances in our streets. And the timing of the op-ed came in an extremely fraught moment when there was really um, active violence going on in our streets and the threat of more violence. I was deeply upset by the op-ed because I thought it wasn't kind of factually fully, I just didn't think it was a fully baked argument. It kind of didn't, in my view, did not make the case for why armed intervention at that time was appropriate. And in fact, didn't really, you know, set guardrails around such an extreme action. So I came out in, as I was certainly not alone, but I was one of many, many, many people, including a number of New York Times staffers who criticized the publication of that op-ed uh, in the moment. Um, the editorial page editor subsequently resigned. And, you know, I've been reflecting on my own actions. I, I certainly was not calling for anyone to um, resign or be fired. It would not have been appropriate for me. Uh, and I'm in the editorial hot seat myself. So I, I hope, you know, people know how, how hard it is to, to, to be an editor. But at the same time, you know, I, at the same time, I thought it was a problematic op-ed. And I've been revisiting, you know, kind of my statements and the positions I took. But I'm, I'm curious about, I've just been re reflecting on them. I mean, I, I don't think in the end I regret what I said, um, but I'm, I'm very, very saddened by the outcome, which, which I did not expect. Um, yeah. Anyway. No, I think that's important. I mean, because there is a relationship between this outcry, you know, uh, much of it on social media and all of it free speech. I mean, you and everybody else is welcome to say whatever they want. They can, you know, be scathing uh, in, in criticizing, you know, any kind of speech. And, and we want to permit that. And, you know, sometimes it's appropriate and warranted. And yet, you know, cumulatively, it can have the effect of, you know, setting a, a boulder in motion that, you know, ultimately kind of clobbers not just the speaker, but anybody associated with uh, these problematic ideas. And so, you know, there's, there's the notion that, you know, those on the internet are sort of powerless and those, you know, who hire and fire are the ones who have all the power. And I think it's a little more complicated like, than that. And that the pressure that, you know, an editor or publisher can feel can be just overwhelming. And it's almost, I mean, I think often of the, the, the Guggenheim Museum when they had this China exhibit that was criticized by animal rights activists. And it was really, you know, I thought a pretty dubious argument because they were showing films of dogs that had done something years ago. They weren't actually abusing any live animals. And yet the uproar was so intense that the museum three days after saying, you know, we're standing firm, we're absolutely going to go forward with this exhibit, you know, reversed itself completely. And they said, well, there were threats of violence. And, it, you know, it wasn't 100% clear that it came down to that. But I think ultimately they just couldn't take it and they're not alone. I think it's really tough when it um, explodes online and it just feels furious and that the, the reputation and, uh, you know, future of the institution may be at stake. So I think for speakers like you, kind of thinking about, you know, the little part you play in that is an important piece. You know, I do think, you know, the part of that story that to me was almost more problematic than the op-ed itself was the fact that the editor hadn't actually read it. And, you know, to me at that moment, I mean, you rightly point out, like, this is a very specific moment when this came out. It really felt like the country was in a combustible state and that we were possibly verging on, you know, serious civil unrest, maybe civil war, maybe the, you know, the Trump administration, you know, mowing people down. It seemed like we were very close to that. And so I think at that moment, just recognizing, okay, you know, we got to read everything really closely. And we just want to think really carefully about what we're putting in print because we've got influence. So that to me, not recognizing, you know, that moment and that this piece was going to enter that moment and that you needed to make a very considered decision in publishing it, like that lapse is hard for me to understand. It's sort of even less about the fact that the piece ultimately went forward than that, you know, they didn't have a system set up to pause and deliberate and really be very careful uh, and considered about it. Well, thank you for your empathy. It's an instructive case study. Um, I'd like to move over to Andrew, if that's a bit, if that's okay, and then we'll have some dialogue between uh, Suzanne and Andrew. Is that all right? Yeah. Andrew, while Suzanne offers kind of a very considered set of principles drawn from her many, many years of thinking about free expression, 
your book is really an incredible, almost anthropological dive into a world of trolls and miscreants and outsized figures. Some of them are committed um, white supremacists or, or other ideologues. Others seem to be more general kind of mischief makers and ne'er-do-wells, but all of them share in common this uh, really sophisticated understanding of technological platforms, uh, not just ones like Google and Facebook, but also um, uh, you know, Reddit, of course, and these chat rooms and discussion spaces where ideas can be, uh, can, uh, well, if, if they can be called such, are really taken to, to extremes. It's, it's a very disturbing book. Can you tell me how you came about um, being interested in these subcultures and communities? Yeah, um, and I, I think in a way that might not be immediately apparent, it kind of rhymes with uh, Suzanne's concerns because I think as uh, she just rightly said, you know, you can't take any of these concerns in isolation. So you can't sort of say, well, I just sort of flatly assert, you know, a right to free speech without considering really the the empirical context of how speech actually works in a society um and i think those those are the uh i think crucial parts of her argument and parts that are often dismissed and so part of my concern was to see okay we might have these like sort of abstract principles about how free speech ought to work but if we don't do the careful observation to see how speech is actually working particularly on the internet which is more and more determining how we communicate and how we learn about and perceive the world, then we'll be operating kind of in a vacuum. So the kind of impetus for all this was just, you know, 2013, 2014, 2015, as a reporter at The New Yorker, I was just sort of kind of looking around me and saying, okay, more and more of our lives are happening online. More and more of our discourse is happening online. It's kind of coming to be clear that those first, you know, 10 years or so of social media where the founders had a kind of halo effect around them and they could were perceived as kind of liberators, you know, progenitors of the Arab Spring, people who could do no wrong. It was starting to become clear that that was a woeful, inaccurate miscalculation. But I didn't think it was good enough to just sort of watch that pendulum shift from one side to the other and say, oh, you know, we used to think that Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey were conquering heroes and disruptors and innovators, and we now think that they're evil robber barons. Um, I didn't think either of those was fine-grained enough. So my project was really to say, okay, if the internet is taking over more and more of our lives and more and more of our experience of how we perceive and how we speak, then what is the internet doing to us specifically? And so I started looking at the dynamics of how social media uh, incentivizes certain kinds of speech over other kinds of speech, how it sets up uh, patterns that are addictive and in other ways destructive. And then getting to the more and more extreme stuff was not just my um, my own masochism and my own desire to see a bunch of terrible stuff, but it was, this is really what happens when these dynamics are left unchecked. Andrew, what ways, t tell us a little bit more about the, the misinformation challenge. You know, I'm thinking about elected officials who have regularly propagated or retweeted or spread misinformation. Uh, I don't think that's limited to the United States. I think it's a global phenomenon, um, disinformation and misinformation. And um, I don't, I, it's hard, I, I think right now the technology platforms are under tremendous political pressure to kind of become speech regulators. But inherently, to me at least, it seems that even, you know, even if some of these leaders deserve to be regulated because they're irresponsible, uh, they're inherently going to run into some of the problems that Suzanne talked about when it comes to ultimately arbitrating what is valid speech. Could you tell us a little bit about that, that dilemma? Yeah, so I think, it's, I think it's perfectly appropriate to be skeptical of handing more power to these companies and these individuals. I think part of the problem is that people like Mark Zuckerberg already have way too much power, so I fully understand why people are skeptical of giving him more power to make more rules for how people can or can't speak online. I think what that discourse often some, uh, sort of misses is that you often hear people start kind of too late in the chain. So they'll say, well, given the world as it is, you know, should we allow 
Facebook and Twitter and Reddit to restrict speech even more? Which is a valid question, but I think it's sort of, um, it's not the initial question. The initial question is, what have these companies done to get us to this toxic place in the first place? We're not, we, we can't just start from the, the current moment as some kind of neutral inherited reality without questioning how we got here. So, you know, to my mind, it's sort of akin to saying like, do you really want McDonald's to, to have more of an influence over what we eat? These companies have a business model that is inherently based on getting more of us to spend more time on their platforms. The way they do that is by hitting what scientists call activating emotions, fear, envy, lust, rage. Their algorithms are very consciously set up to do that. So it sort of sounds nice in, in the abstract to say, well, we want to give everyone a voice. And you know, you hear people like Mark Zuckerberg giving these lofty speeches where they say, I believe in people and I think everyone should have a voice. That's all fine. But again, it's like, you know, the CEO of McDonald's saying, I believe in people and I think they should make a choice about what kind of French fries they want to eat. Sure. I don't think people should be sent to jail for eating French fries, but I think you can also own up to your corporate responsibility in, in making people more obese. Someone who occasionally likes chicken McNuggets, I, 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 I feel they're so innocuous right now compared to the hateful speech on 8chan and 4chan that you, right. you've exposed. Um, tell me a little bit about, um, tell us a little bit about the, you know, phenomena like that of the of so-called uh, pizza gate. I think for, uh, for me at least, um, and I was living overseas at the time, that violence that occurred when, when a man shot up a pizza parlor under the belief that um, the business was being used by Hillary Clinton as a underground child sex ring was really beyond shocking. I, I just hadn't followed that thread of a story um, until, until it really happened. And it, was, it remains to me today one of the most disturbing examples of um, distortions and mistruths leading to actual harm. Um, are cases like that on the rise? Well, it's hard to say. And, and this is something where I think uh, Suzanne and I can, can get into a useful area of both agreement and disagreement possibly, which is um, it's not clear to me that hate crimes are on the rise or that um, misinformation related attacks are on the rise. I, I, it's hard to know because as Suzanne points out in her book, these things are, are usually underreported and it's it's hard to categorize them. It, the FBI has one definition of a hate crime. Obviously, you know, Germany or France would categorize it differently. So it's tricky to know whether it's up 11% this year or 12%. Or um, and I, I guess what I would argue is that you can frame it more broadly than that and say, there are incidents like Pizzagate that cause material harm. And then there are things like, um, vaccine denialism or climate change denialism or the denialism of racism and misogyny that lead to much wider scale harm, such as making the planet uninhabitable within 12 years. So, um, you know, it just depends how broadly you want to widen the scope and say, you know, is misinformation leading to tangible destruction? It, it is in the case of things like Pizzagate and it also is in the case of things like the melting polar ice caps. Just, just to describe what the Pizzagate thing is, um, there was this vast internet conspiracy that is too Byzantine to fully get into, but basically based on the leaked emails of John Podesta, who was one of uh, Hillary Clinton's top campaign advisors, saying that you know when he was talking about things like cheese and pizza, he didn't actually mean cheese and pizza, he meant uh, child sex slaves that he was trafficking in with Hillary Clinton's either knowledge or participation and that those children were being held at a particular pizza restaurant in Washington, D.C. Uh, this was all wrong. I think it should go without saying, but it apparently needs to be said that this wasn't the case. And in fact, the pizza restaurant that was purported to have children in its basement uh, didn't even have a basement. But the, the guy who, um, there was a guy in North Carolina who was reading this stuff on the internet. He was far from the only person who was reading that stuff, but he was the only person who that day decided to drive to Washington DC with an AR-15 and go into the pizza place and start shooting to try to liberate those children. Now, again, you can look at that narrow case and say, this is a very clear example of internet misinformation leading to tangible harm in the world. 
but I would argue that the instances in terms of our uh, more attenuated public conversation are much bigger than that. And in many cases, the consequences are much graver. Really good point. One more question before we, we have the uh, dialogue between you and Suzanne. Um, you followed a whole group of people who, you know, it, who in some ways were emboldened and were already active before President Trump's election in 2016, but suddenly really found themselves kind of emboldened and empowered. I mean, there's a remark, there are remarkable scenes in your book from the events surrounding President Trump's inauguration. Now, I'm certainly not saying, and I don't think you are either, that President Trump is the author or the, or the main cause of, of uh, the misinformation crisis, but he certainly in many ways has benefited from and amplified uh, uh, falsehoods and, and mistruths. What's your sense of these um, uh, these act, these uh, these actors and and trolls this time around? Uh, are they, you know, are they as powerful as ever? Have they gained force and gained steam since the last election cycle? And what impact might their digital actions have on this on this fall's election? Yeah, I mean, I think you kind of couldn't come up with a better example of these multiple overlapping forces than Donald Trump if you tried. I mean, if you were, you know, Margaret Atwood writing a novel, I don't, I don't know if we're not allowed to mention her anymore since she signed the Harper's letter. I don't know if she's canceled, but um, if, you were, if you were writing a, a novelized version of our current timeline and you wanted to illustrate just how toxic these forces can be, you, you couldn't do better than to make up Donald Trump. Um, he just is very much a creature of these environments. He thrives in them. He, you know, he easily won Alex Jones's endorsement, um, which, you know, it's easy to joke about, but that is actually a very powerful thing. And um, that's why Roger Stone worked so hard to get Trump the Alex Jones endorsement. I mean, these things, it's very easy to laugh them off from the position of the kind of center of the discourse where we are at, you know, the New Yorker and the LA Times and at Penn. But, you know, again, just empirically looking at how this stuff travels, you know, one of the things about the internet is that it is very democratic and that obviously has upsides. I think we should be very careful to emphasize that that has huge upsides. It allows things like Black Lives Matter to happen. It allows things like, you know, the death of George Floyd to be seen widely as it should be. Th those can never be discounted, but I just think that for so long we were so in denial of the fact that with an upside comes a downside and you just, you can't do better to, to personify that downside than to just see what happens. And as you pointed out, it's not just here, it's Bolsonaro in Brazil, it's Duterte in the Philippines, it's, you know, you can just go down the list, Boris Johnson. Um, when you just have constant bile and bigotry and misinformation as the official voice of the state, enabled and in many cases just fully facilitated by social media, uh, there's a huge number of negative downstream effects from that. And it doesn't have to, you don't have to win a, a, a national election for that to be the case. To your, to your question about the, the people in my book, you know, the people in my book were always kind of a test case. They were, they were um, when you do this kind of narrative journalism, um, I think it was uh, Lawrence Wright who described it as, you know, you're looking for a donkey. You're looking for someone who can put your set of concerns on their back and carry you through the story. So, you know, in Larry Wright's case, that was people who could lead him through the story of Scientology. Uh, in my case, these were people who could be our Virgils through the nine circles of the underworld that is the modern internet. If those particular Virgils, you know, decide to take a nap through the next election cycle or not, the, the underlying mechanisms that they reveal are still there. So in some cases, the people I wrote about have kind of gone away and tried some other form of grift. Um, in other cases, they're anchors on major news networks. You know, um, Jack Posobiec was one of the, you know, uh, bigoted hucksters who I wrote about in, in my book, who you might think would just kind of go away once Roger Stone was out of the picture, but he's now a, a primetime anchor on OAN, which is the president's favorite network. So sometimes their, uh, their influence wanes, sometimes it rises, but what they can show us that the mechanisms they reveal, the systemic problems they reveal are not going away. Your book has a lot of um, humor in it, um, for, surprising for such a dark topic, but were you ever yourself tempted to be drawn into this Hades of conspiracy theory, theorizing and rumor mongering and? Yeah, 
I always tried to have a, a kind of badge on that said temporary visitor, you know, please, please return back to, you know, above ground if found. I mean, uh, you know, it's funny, there are things where, again, when we don't look carefully at this stuff, we can kind of paint it with a broad brush and caricature it in ways that make us less able to be inoculated against it, right? So with misinformation, you know, it, it seems like someone like an Alex Jones or a Roger Stone or even a Donald Trump would be just making stuff up out of thin air when in fact, you know, there are things that it's based on. There are undercurrents, there are sort of submerged narratives that if you don't understand them, you can't combat them. Uh, by the same token with the really deep hate stuff, because I do get into, you know, post Charlottesville, I, I have run-ins with neo-Nazis and, you know, alt-right figures like Richard Spencer. The reason I got into any of that stuff was not that I sort of was trying to look for the kernel of truth in it. That was not my project. Um, I'm Jewish. I think Nazis are very, very bad. I don't, you know, I'm not trying to do a both sides thing there. But what I do think is important is, again, if we, if we take the caricatured version of it, which is to say, these are people who have hatred in their heart and, you know, they can't stand to be in the same room with someone who looks different than them and they don't like gay people. All these things, all these caricatures would be inaccurate. And so, again, you can't understand how this stuff operates and you can't help people get unbrainwashed from it unless you just understand the basic mechanics of what the theory is. And in almost every case, the, the specifics of the theory and the specifics of the people who fall prey to it are almost never what you would expect them to be. Really interesting. Uh, let's bring Suzanne back into the conversation and uh, I'd love to see some uh, debate and exchange going on here. Yeah. Welcome back, Suzanne. Thanks. So I guess my first question for, for the two of you is really about the, you know, the, the promise and the peril of technology. You know, should, should, the, platforms, uh, should the platforms be more regulated? Um, are reform proposals like Facebook's oversight board a good idea? Um, is it good that Twitter and Facebook are now tagging uh, false information when it comes from political leaders? Should they be doing more of it? Should they have editors or content monitors, or a lot more of them, to, to kind of monitor this, you know, tidal wave uh, of speech that's coursing through our computers every day? Suzanne. Yeah, sure. Well, look, they're not easy questions. I don't think anyone has the answer to all of this. I have a couple of chapters in my book that sort of, you know, point out two sides of this argument. On the one hand, you know, we should be very leery about giving the platforms unfettered uh, dis uh, discretion to mediate the vast proportion of public discourse that now takes place through their channels, you know, and that's for a whole host of reasons. They, they do a poor job of it. They, you know, have their own ideological biases. They're motivated by profit. Uh, they're manipulable. They're non-transparent. You know, there's kind of a hundred reasons to be leery of it. And yet, you know, also as, as Andrew, you know, lays out so compellingly in his book, you know, the damage is profound and far-reaching and, you know, earth-shaking, you know, when you think about the, the climate and the future of American democracy and the rise of authoritarianism around the globe that has been fueled by these platforms, it's essential that they assume some accountability. So the question is, you know, how to get it right, how to minimize the downsides and, uh, you know, maximize the potential to get the, the dark sides and, and dangerous aspects of our online discourse under control, you know, and I think we know some things about how that can be done. And there are other things we don't know. I think part of it is transparency. And I think that's a place where government regulation, you know, is appropriate in terms of forcing this out into the open. I mean, researchers have a terrible time trying to even just get the data to analyze how content moves through these networks and, you know, what happens when things are suppressed. So I think that's part of it. I do think when it comes to uh, government leaders that the answer is not removing the speech because I think people need to hear what, uh, you know, their officials are saying and what their president is saying and that, that, you know, that's vital political information. But I think contextualizing it and applying similar rules that would uh, inhabit if, if it were another speaker is appropriate. This idea that, you know, we put political leadership above the rules that everybody else is expected to obey, uh, you know, I think is very problematic. I, you know, I think the other kind of holy grail of it is really the algorithms and the ways in which the most, it's, 
incendiary and problematic speech is, you know, not just allowed on the platforms, but in many ways elevated and amplified because what they see is that there's tremendous engagement in these niche communities, you know, around provocative, combustible ideas. And so those posts are pushed forward in ways that are impossible to see. And, you know, that, that, that layer of artificial intelligence that animates these platforms is, is, you know, very healthily shielded from public view. And, you know, by many accounts, it's sort of the main reason content becomes weaponized online. And if you could kind of neutralize all that, and, you know, the, the white supremacist was just literally, you know, had to sort of make something out of it, you know, with his 300 followers, it might not get very far. And so I think transparency, you know, in terms of how that level operates and a degree of responsibility to recognize that there's certain content that, you know, may not, you may not have grounds to expunge it from the platform, but that it, it, it certainly needs to, uh, you know, not be elevated or, or, or exposed to people that aren't, you know, very actively seeking it out. Yeah, I, I agree with with pretty much everything that Suzanne is saying. I think um, I think the 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 number one baseline agreement we can have and sort of get out of the way is that government should not be restricting speech. I think that's you know just clearly implied by the First Amendment or or stated by the First Amendment. I mean, I say implied because it literally says Congress and then it gets incorporated. But so we can sort of take that off the table as a as a thing to disagree about. I think when it comes to the platforms, since they're not government entities. Um, I agree with pretty much everything uh, Suzanne is saying, especially you know the the importance of the algorithms. I guess the only uh, sort of way I would come at it a bit differently is is to not think of the algorithms as um, as only applying to the fringe. Um, you know, I, I think where I would uh, you know come at that a bit a bit differently is to say you know yes, these algorithmic incentives toward being provocative or being outrageous work for a, a white supremacist with three hundred followers. Uh, but they also work for a white supremacist with 60 million followers who's the president of the United States. So um, the, the dynamics are the same. And um, I think that we sometimes at our peril uh, try to marginalize this stuff as, as you know, concerns that only apply at, at margins. But, you know, I, to return to my analogy about food, just because I think it helps us um, keep track of this stuff, you know, or, or opiates, let's say. It's not like there's, you know, some hidden 1% of the populace that's subject to becoming addicted to opiates. It's really all of us. And, you know, I make my critiques about McDonald's french fries while I mean, I didn't even realize this, but I'm literally, you know, drinking their coffee right now. So it's not like none of us is immune to this stuff, right? So the algorithms play on all of us. We all see misinformation. We can't avoid it. We all see hatred. We're, we, we actually, hatred is in many cases the, the, the water we're swimming in just living in a country that was founded on genocide and slavery, right? So I, I, you know, these things get reduced to sort of talking points sometimes. I'm not saying anyone here is doing it, but you know, it sometimes gets added as an afterthought. But as we all know, this stuff is not an afterthought. It doesn't have to be the essence of, you know, the only thing we are as Americans, but it is a powerful thing. And I think Suzanne is careful to point this out in her book. And um, I think what one place where we really agree is that, you know, she's careful to say, you can't only point to the ways in which you shouldn't restrict speech. You also have to point to, to the ways in which you can affirmatively create an environment that allows speech to flourish. And that's something that these companies have not only failed to do, but have actively worked against in many instances. A couple of personal questions. Does each of you use social media? And if so, which platforms and for what purposes? Yeah, well, I'm, uh, yeah. I'm I'm drinking my McDonald's right now, so I'm I'm not a I'm not a purist Kantian about this. I'm not you know worried about sort of being personally sullied. I worry about not letting my kids go on YouTube, and I worry about um, not letting myself get too addicted to this stuff. But I, I'm not a, a pure um, abstainer. Yeah, look, I think there's a lot that's great about social media. I mean, for me, uh, I'm in touch with so many more people. And honestly, during the pandemic, it's been fantastic to just be able to sustain these connections, what feels like somewhat effortlessly. So I am not an abolitionist by any stretch of the imagination. I hope we can get this right. You know, and I think, it, you know, the COVID uh, situation has illustrated in some ways with the elevation, you know, Andrew's talking about Indigo about kind of elevating useful content, uh, you know, and actually the platforms have demonstrated they're quite 
capable of doing that, you know, when it comes to COVID, they, uh, you know, made sure if you do any COVID related search, and I see this myself all the time, you know, the WHO and the CDC and other credible sources of information, you know, pop up right there. And it's, it's, it's quite visible. And, you know, they're trying to sort of steer you away from the conspiracists and the quacks. You know, I don't know exactly how well it's working, but it uh, is the most visible kind of demonstration of their power to elevate credible information that I think we've seen and, you know, hopefully maybe provides, a, a, you know, the beginnings of a path forward for other types of information where we also want credible science, uh, you know, and, and facts to uh, take the foreground. Members of the Literary Alliance um, always want to know what authors are themselves reading. Could each of you give us a glimpse of what your nightstands look like? Uh, one is She Said by Jody Cantor and Megan Tuohy, and the other is uh, John Bolton's The Room Where It Happened. Uh, I could consult my bookshelf too, I guess. Um, I mean, right here, there's some three modern classics about how the internet works. Yeah. I mean, uh, Zuboff. Yeah. And Morantz. <laughs> Obviously, the, the the Trinity. I don't. Um, those are one. Those are ones I've already read. But um, I'm reading uh, Rick Perlstein's um, Tetralogy right now. The last of which is coming out next month. Um, History of conservatism. Yeah. History of modern conservatism, starting with Goldwater and going through the ascent of Reagan. And um, and fiction wise, I'm. Um, in the middle of, um, well, I'm about to start the Miriam Toes book, Women Talking. That's supposed to be excellent. I just um, just picked it up. Um, yeah, I, I would say that when I'm writing, I read more fiction than nonfiction, just for the rhythm of it. Um, are there any authors that you've read whose, that you can think of recently, whose beliefs you found troubling or offensive or challenging in ways that would reflect on, that would inform this free speech discussion that we're having right now? Let's see. You know, I, I guess I've, I've been grappling with something, not sure the answer to it. You know, Ibram Kendi's seminal uh, book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, you know, I think has really sort of recast the conversation and, uh, you know, made us all think at a new level about what we need to do to sort of play a responsible role in society uh, and in driving forward a more equal society. Um, you know, and, and the question I've just been asking myself is, you know, when it comes to racist attitudes, you know, we recognize they're endemic. And, you know, he really, you know, makes this point that we're all racist. Um, and so, you know, at what point should it become kind of a punishable offense? And obviously at the margins, that's an easy question if somebody's, you know, a, a, a known bigot and, you know, undercutting an equal environment in a classroom, you know, those are easy cases. But I think that, you know, harder cases are, for example, these students who are seeing their admission to universities rescinded on the basis of, you know, a video or a social media po uh, post where they express something that, you know, seems to be racist, but you know, you know, who knows what kind of communities they've grown up in, you know, maybe this is all they've heard their whole lives. They're 17 years old. We know we live in a, you know, systematically racist society. And, you know, is it right to uh, punish that, you know, or does the kind of possibility of transformation that, you know, Kendi points to and, and, and pushes us toward, you know, does that demand, you know, some opportunity for, reconciliation and dialogue, you know, with that person to bring them to a different place. So that's, that's one question I've been struggling with. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it is an interesting, there was in the New York Times coverage of the Harper's letter, uh, Reginald Dwayne Betts is one of the signers who said, you know, I went to prison and got out. I obviously believe in the possibility of rehabilitation and restoration. And, you know, I think the, the balance with all that stuff is trying to find how you maintain hope in the possibility of restoration and rehabilitation and redemption without becoming so permissive that you're not able to use social opprobrium when it's necessary. And I guess I, I'm not an optimist generally by temperament, but I tend to be pretty optimistic that, you know, we're sort of figuring it out and that, you know, 
we shouldn't elevate concerns about cancel culture too much to the point where we see it as on the level of, you know, actual authoritarianism. So I think that's the delicate balance. And that, to me, there, it's, a, it's a question of emphasis. I, I think everyone can agree that there are points when pylons and hordes and cancel culture can go too far. The question is, are we elevating that concern beyond necessity to serve some other agenda? For each of you, what was the greatest challenge in writing your book? I mean, I, you know, writing is just really hard. And I mean, the, 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 the logistical challenge is just finding uninterrupted stretches of time because there's, you know, a logarithmic effect that happens the longer, the, the, the more hours you have in a row, the more effective you can be rather than grabbing a half hour here and 20 minutes there. Um, and then the, 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 the sort of ethical challenge I had was when to, when to give exposure rather than oxygen, when to uh, avoid covering someone because you're worried that covering them at all or covering them in the wrong way or covering them in too even handed a way might be playing into their aims. You know, I was dealing with a lot of tricksters and propagandists. And so I was constantly engaged with this question of when am I being used as a vector for their propaganda? And when am I soft peddling and doing this pretense of objectivity, which is actually letting them off the hook? And then conversely, if I become too polemical and too strident, when does that just stop being interesting to a reader? Yeah, I would say, look, the practical challenge was the discipline of it. I run a busy organization. So I had one month off uh, during which I had to sort of break the back of this project uh, last summer. And, you know, if I didn't, you know, I knew that once I was back at work, kind of, you know, all bets were off. And so just the intensity of that slog was something that, you know, I think the other piece for me was, you know, writing about controversial issues and sort of just knowing, you know, some people are going to come after you by, uh, you know, if you defend this one or if you call them to question that, you know, dare to speak indeed, you know, just even kind of wading into all this, you know, just seeing what happens online feels risky. And I'm sure, you know, what I wrote was not perfect. And, you know, people will uh, pull it apart. And, you know, I hope it, 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 it largely stands. But, you know, you have to be ready for that. Well, uh, I know that, especially in this time of great hardship and uh, turmoil, uh, books have been one of the few anchors of our civilization and our society and given us a chance to connect, uh, even if virtually. So uh, it especially is important to me that books about free expression, about the exchange of ideas, um, difficult books, like the, like the books that you've written, Antisocial by Andrew Morantz mm -hmm. and Dare to Speak by Suzanne Nossel. Uh, are, are more important than ever. So I just really wanted to thank all of you for engaging in this discussion and for giving us a chance to learn more about your, your wonderful work. Thank you, Sewell, and thank you, Pasadena Literary Alliance, and thank you, readers of Pasadena and beyond, because we're just so grateful to you for your interest in these books and these topics and uh, really enjoy being part of the conversation that uh, you're involved in. Yeah, thanks so much, guys. And Sewell, your apartment looks fantastic. Come visit sometime. Thanks, everyone. Bye.